what I'm going to do today, chaps, is really focus on on what's been done and what's been what's been done in the past and what we've achieved, I guess, in the uh, in the Kusumo area, and throw in a bit of history as well, because I like that history biz, and there's the disclaimer. And this is a summary of, of really where we are in 2019. The Kimlaat field here in the Kusumo were discovered by, by us, Hugh and myself, in the mid 2005s when we discovered uh, two of the present uh, four Kimlaat bodies that are in, in the tenement area that we have. Uh, as we said before, only about 18 or 20 kilometers away from from uh, where we are right now and from the city of Kusumo. Uh, the involvement of the company that I was with at the time when we made these original discoveries ceased uh, in, the, uh, in about 2007 for all sorts of reasons. And in essence, the expiration of this part of Finland died when we left the country. Uh, in two, two years ago, two and a half years ago, Buddy and I and Pat got together and came up with a concept of, of reviving this, uh, this field for, for many reasons, and uh, I'll, um, I'll touch on some of those later on. But basically, because it was, in Buddy and my opinion, a world class diamond project, almost completely untouched, except for the discovery of seriously diamond refresh kimberlites. At the moment, we have uh, two exploration permits. These are sort of small, um, several hundred hectare bodies, uh, uh, exploration areas, that make up a total of about 1,300 hectares, and Buddy will go through these tomorrow. And in addition, three much larger reservations that, uh, that cover the, the region over the area of about 2,000 square kilometers. So not only do we have this Kusumo area all to ourselves, but we have the Kusumo area and the prospective areas just about completely sealed, sealed up for our own, our own prospecting pleasure. Uh, Last year we started our very first intensive uh, inspection and drilling of the um, of the wolves, and we pulled out a whole swag of uh, of core which we sent over to Canada for fusion work. And again, Buddy will go into detail with this, and I'll show you some other figures a little later on. But from the first three Kiplots bodies that we produced, we pulled out about just under a, a ton of core, and we've recovered 1,700 diamonds from that, uh, that material. Now, I've been in this business for a few years now, and this is about as good a result as I've ever seen. Uh, this has given us, I think, a lot of encouragement, and I guess reinforced our, our faith in the execution of our project as being really prospective. We've just uh, started off an excavator sampling program, um, which is ongoing right now, and uh, we'll be um, getting into ground geophysics and, uh, and some airborne geophysics later on in the year as well. Right. I'm not going to go through this because Hughes mentioned this. And uh, what I will do is this is where the, the history part comes in. So prepare to be stunned and amazed. In the mid uh, 1990s, I ended up for my sins sitting for seven years in the town of Achandelskia, freezing my burning nuts off, and uh, was involved in the discovery of uh, the grip pipe. But at the same time as I was doing that, I was also doing exploration, town exploration for the Russian company that was our joint venture partner. Over about 
I think about 850 kilometers from this red star, which is the Ladoga light. It's a, a kimberlitic type body down the south near Lake Ladoga, all the way up to about here. And uh, I've been involved with the Russians off and on ever since then, up to last year. Uh, and as a result of this, I've been party to an enormous amount of uh, exploration data that the Russians have been involved in since the mid-1950s. And uh, they have sampled the living bejesus out of this zone and have got heaps and heaps and heaps of indicator minerals and a few small diamonds. And up here, just over there, Two years ago, when I was working in this part of the world, not my crew, but a, a, another group living in the tent camp that we were sharing, pulled out a, a 2.8 carat diamond out of um, the, uh, the till that they were sampling. Now that's, in my opinion, probably actually unheard of. It, it may have happened once or twice where you get big diamonds like that in Canada, but it's never happened in in Finland, and uh, it gave everybody a, a, a big job. The, the problem that we've, we've realized, of course, is that as Hugh was showing, and I'll reinforce it just now, all of these till sheets that cover this whole area have come from Finland. So I'm pretty convinced that the um, most of the indicator minerals, and certainly the diamonds that we found up here, have not come from Russia at all, they come from, from Finland. And this is a slide that sort of uh, illustrates what we were talking about and what you mentioned. There's Lake Ladoga, and these are the big ice sheets that covered the whole of this region up to uh, 10,000 years ago, uh, and in fact, covered all of this stuff here with a grip pipe. Is, just as a matter of interest, the grip is 65 meters from the surface. It's got 65 meters of completely barren rock sitting above it. Uh, crazy, crazy luck involved in this one. The exploration that we've, we're doing here in, the, in Finland is really exploration that was uh, kicked off by the GTK, the Geological Survey, Hughes folk who have been working in these glacial environments for, for many, many years now. And in essence, as far as Kimbrats go, what, they, what you have is these big glaciers moving along. They pick up material hit from that's been eroded out of the, uh, the Kimberlites, spread them along the, uh, the base, the glaciers melt, and all these things drop down to the bottom of the uh, of the sediment. Uh, that's because that's what that was the uh, glacial material. And we come along and using the technique that the Finns have, uh, have uh, come up with, where we can get uh, uh, sufficiently shallow till up to about five or six meters. We can get down there and take till samples in the order of 100 uh, kilograms each. And uh, we then take them off to laboratories here in Finland, get them uh, concentrated, and then send those concentrates off to various laboratories around the world. And this technique has been enormously successful here in Finland. Uh, it's really only applicable in Finland in this in a large way because of the access. You can get vehicles in, and diggers, excavators in just about anywhere if you try hard enough. It's really a remarkable place for doing diamond expression of this, of this type. Going back one bit, this was the, the northern uh, transect of my 800 kilometer journey from southern. Russia down to the north here, and it was in this area, just north of where our present walls are, that we found uh, this 2.8 carat diamond. So somewhere west of, or about here, 
there's a body that's producing 2.8 carat diamonds. This is a spread of sample sites that uh, we, we collected from the Kusumo area. Kusumo is down here somewhere. Uh, we started off on the Russian border, which is right here. That uh, pirate that we picked up is a Super Gene 10, and it remains the single best quality pirate indicator mineral that I've ever seen reported from anywhere in Finland. It's really incredible, the uh, uh, discovery. Anyway, we, with European Diamonds, who uh, I was working with at the time, we took this, we assumed it was just one train. We don't believe it is anymore, but we made that assumption. Worked our way up here, made a, uh, a very big discovery uh, here, and this thing turned out to be the first of the walls that we uh, that we draw, and that was white wall. Yeah. Yeah. This is a graph to showing or illustrating those uh, the chemistry of the indicator minerals that um, Hugh was talking about, and the indicator minerals that we've been finding in until historically. These G10 um, uh, bodies, which have uh, very low um, amounts of calcium in them and pretty high amounts of chrome, are really indicative of a diamondiferous source. Now, down the bottom here, we've got this eclogitic field, again, that you touched on. And the importance of eclogitic samples is only just recently being understood. Without eclogitic diamonds, most of the world's diamond mines wouldn't be profitable. These eclogitic diamonds produce these wonderful white stones that uh, people were talking about coming out of India in the historic past. And without these white uh, type two diamonds coming out of the eclogitic suite, Attracting stone values of $1,000, 10000 $20,000 a carat, you wouldn't have uh, enough um, uh, value in most of the kimberlites in the world that are being mined to, to make them commercial. So these eclogitic beasts are really, really important. Uh, Stepping back two years, this is about where we were uh, when Arctic got involved in the Kusumo area. The, uh, the area that you talked about, Kusumo South, is here in the in the red circle. Uh, the three or four, I think it might be five bodies that were discovered historically in late 2005 and uh, and one one or two since then. Um, None of them have a, a chemistry that makes one confident that they're going to be diamond difference. Totally, totally opposite to that is the wolf. All of the indicator minerals that we found to date, again historically, not just at the wolves but elsewhere here, look very persuasively, as if it's lighting up a diamondiferous kimberlite field. We've, I'm pretty sure that uh, there's no doubt in my mind that, that there's made major differences in, in uh, diamond potential from the southern part to the northern part, and uh, uh, one of the reasons why we've been concentrating up in the north thus far. These are these three. Yeah, time, yeah. These three tenements here are the large um, uh, reservations that we've taken out that cover the 2,000 square kilometres. Again, showing the uh, the ice direction going from west to east, 
And the main reason for taking out the area to the north is because that's where we've got our 2.8 character from. Uh, now, going back to Geology 101. Everybody's familiar with the carrot shape kimberlites. Most people are familiar with these champagne uh, shaped kimberlites and the Fort Alicorn type, which uh, a lot of people know about in, in Canada, is some sort of a hybrid of the two. And that's fine, and this was this was common knowledge up until Oh, five years ago, or something like that, when people started to recognize that in many of the areas in Canada, there was another class of Kimberlites, um, which I'm calling the Mountain Province Renard style Kimberlites, and I know Mr. Doyle's going to take one task about that, but uh, what the hell. <laughs> He's done it before today. Um, these are bodies, kimberlite bodies, uh, such as the Mountain Province, Gauchar, Kwai, <coughs> what have you, and also Renard to some degree, that appear to have never actually got to the surface of the crust. They have come up from, from the mantle down the bottom there, and for whatever reason, they've stopped before they got to the crust. One or two of them may have, may have uh, exploded like a, like a regular kimberlite, but many of them seem to be frozen uh, and completely surrounded, i.e. blind. You, of course, then get situations where you have erosion at the top here, and that erosion can lower the, uh, the land surface, and so that these things then become exposed. But in general, this is what's happening, and you you get some very very odd features occurring uh, that do not in any way um, reflect either the uh, circular uh, um, lamproite feature, such as what you have in, in uh, Western Australia, or the carrot shaped kimberlite feature that is uh, well known in, in Africa <coughs> and in, in Canada. The Tuzo pipe is, is one of these things, and uh, that's a, that's a two-dimensional picture of what this pipe actually looks like at depth. Instead of being the, the reverse of a carrot shape, it's an inverted uh, triangle, and the body gets uh, probably three or four times larger by the time you get to 100 or 120 meters on the surface up from, from where it's exposed up top here. So that's, that was a wake up call for everybody who was thinking about these things. Then you have a look at plain, plain of, uh, uh, feet images of an, another one of the Western uh, Mountain Province uh, deposits being mined at the moment, <coughs> and for all the world, that looks like a bloody snake. <laughs> There's no other kimberlite that I know of in the world that I've visited that looks like that. That's really weird, but it's it's there. Then you look at Kelvin in the next door uh, part of the um, Mountain Province field, and you get more weird bloody shapes. These things have never seen the surface. They stop over there. Uh, they're exposed in the pit, but, uh, and when you do expose them, you get this very crazy shape. Then you get another thing that goes to the extremes, and we've seen these things do right angles down at depth, 100, 100 odd meters. Buddy will talk about these tomorrow. Totally different from the accepted uh, format of, of Kimberlite geology up until uh, a few years ago. I put this one in about Renard because it illustrates another part of, uh, of what these, these particular blind 
um, kimbats are all about. They usually occur in linear, linear zones. Uh, Hugh mentioned this a little earlier, and this is a good dis uh, image that illustrates that feature. We've now, we've now discovered a whole bunch of, of kimberlites in, this, in the wolf area, and it's my belief that what we're dealing with here is something exactly the same as, the, uh, as these weird features in northern Canada, and probably being one of the reasons responsible for the fact that these kimberlites have stayed hidden. For, for so long, um, just because they look so so different from the accepted accepted forms. Okay, this is the original mining license that we had had uh, two years ago uh, around the wolves. We had the uh, the wolf pack down here in the southern part. Uh, last year we found um, some small, crazy looking. Um, Kimberlites up in the north. We have a very good um, indicator mineral response just over here. Unfortunately, well, and just over the border of this nature reserve, we've got a perfect uh, mag target. Two thousand and five or four. We went. We went into this area. We didn't know it was a nature reserve at the time. And took a bloody sample on top of the Maybe it wasn't. And uh, <coughs> Hugh thinks we've got a thousand pirates, I think it was about 850. But it was the biggest result that we'd ever got. So we're, we're fairly confident that within that, that uh, the original license area, we've got at least three, three areas where, uh, where Kimberlites are present. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here was right down on the bottom, there's this east-west line here. That's the uh, tide road that we'll be driving down tomorrow. Uh, and we'll move off the tide road over here, drive up uh, 100 or so metres. And uh, those of you who are feeling terribly energetic can walk up to Grey Wolf. And the rest of us will go by bus. So. Uh, you're allowed to take your pick. Bit of history. This is Dr. O'Brien doing his bit in the summer of 2005, being very masculine and, uh, and technical at the same time. And this was the discovery drilling at White Wolf. We didn't have any of this mag data that this, uh, this image shows when we were working in the early days in 2005 in this part of the world, but we lucked in here and then we, we drilled a couple more holes and realised that we had a, uh, a good looking Kimberlite here at White Wolf and then we had a bloody big winter and then we uh, took an excavator uh, 40 metres away to the west of, of White Wolf and dug a hole, and that's the discovery of, of Black Wolf. It's outcropping right underneath the, the um, ice. That was the discovery pit with uh, the orange looking kimberlite right at the, at the uh, upper surface in the root zone. This is what they call yellow ground, which is a highly uh, weathered form of kimberlite which I've only ever seen in, in, um, in Africa. Uh, so it's, just, it's really unusual. I don't think any of it exists in Canada, probably not. But this is, this is all good technical stuff. And Mr. Doyle will have this slide again. But uh, what it does is just reinforce the uh, number of, of uh, micro diamonds that we've, we've pulled out of the now three wolf uh, bodies. <coughs> Uh, in total, about 1,700 diamonds have come out of 950 kilograms of, uh, of um, kimberlite. Uh, amazing.
figures. Well, I guess people want to know what you're going to do now. <laughs> I, can, I can hear you wincing from here. I'm a great believer in, in magnetics. I'm a, a great believer in magnetics. We have really high quality uh, closely spaced magnetics over this part of, of the wolf pack. This is the white wolf and that's black and that distance from there to there is uh, 40 or 50 meters. We've just recently uh, done detailed uh, magnetic modeling of the data over the wolf um, area and the uh, consultants that we were using with myself came up with this image and it's a three, it's a two-dimensional uh, picture of a three-dimensional um, uh, magnetic block. All of the, all of the uh, green areas here are what we would uh, predict would be kinetic. Now you immediately see that these are the drill holes. We've only drilled down to about a maximum of 30 meters from the surface at White Wolf and, and a similar, perhaps a little shallower, drilling at Black Wolf. And yes, we know there's a gap there. We've proven that. But we've never looked at whatever this beast is. We have no idea what this is. And if we go uh, another uh, 100 or so meters Westwards from uh, Black Wolf, we get to Gray. And I'm sorry, there's Gray there. It's a for some reason well, it's not showing up very well in the in the magnetics. And I can hear Mr. Dill saying, "I told you so." Uh, again, but further west over here, another couple of hundred meters, there's a block of something magnetic uh, sitting there that has the exact same magnetic signature as these two bits. I went back to our first drilling in 2004 in this White Wolf area. We drilled a whole D476 here. Uh, well, sorry, nice. it is there on the, on the west. We got a Kimberlite, we got a Kimberlite type right there. So I think it's a very, very persuasive argument that at least we should be focusing on this area to see what the rest of these green areas are all about. So that would be, for me, the very first uh, area that I look at. What I'm going to be looking at, well, what we're going to be looking at next, is the area to the west of, uh, of the walls. These are the walls here with the, uh, with the stars on them. And these, these, uh, I'm totally running out of gas for this or anything, are uh, what we're looking at at the moment as the work that we're doing at the moment in the field is a um, is the very first part of a much more extensive uh, excavator and drilling program that's going to uh, test all of these those anomalies you see there and in particular the ones that are, are circled with uh, the yellow colors. There's another set up in the northwest of the slide that has very similar magnetic uh, qualities to these beasts down in the wolf area, and we'll be looking at that. To the east of, of the wolves, to the right of the slide, there are similar looking magnetic features, and we're going to be looking at that, and that's what we're calling our western and eastern wolf project. Uh, and just in case you don't believe me, which you should, because I'm never lost in your distance. This is, this is the magnetic data that we produced in 2005, after we had discovered the, um, the, uh, the two walls to the east here. And we knew that there were these magnetic features. We did nothing about them because of lack of funds and lack of interest by the management, we believe that there's a really good reason to, to say that there's some of these 
in these magnetic anomalies are going to come up with Kimberlite. You can never say 100% with, with geophysics, and again, Buddy will, will agree with me on that one. Uh, there's more geopoetry created by the geophysicists than Shakespeare. But I threw that in just to show you that I'm not bullshit. And there's a, a line profile over one of our anomalies. There's something there. If we go two kilometers north of the walls, we get to what we call the Vice area. Here's the walls. Two kilometers up here is the Vice area. I'll put a close up slide of that that's coming through shortly. We've got a feature here which we call the comet. Uh, we tried to excavate that last year and failed because the, uh, the till is greater than six, six meters thick here. But this is going to be a high priority target uh, that we've been looking at this year. So this is the Western Wolf. Here's features in the southern part of it. And then if I go on to, to the Vasa area. In the old days, the good old, old days of uh, the early exploration here, we've got some seriously good indicator mineral chemistry till samples along this line. We put in a, uh, a couple of excavated pits in the middle of last year and that feature there uh, came up with Kimberlite. It's called the Vasa Kimberlite. They look like dikes. But what it's doing is showing us that this feature here really deserves much closer, closer inspection. We've got about uh, a kilometre and a half of strike length that has not been touched. Uh, we really need to get in here and find out what all these bodies are about. And then if I go another 500 metres to the west, we've got this fellow sitting here. I don't know what that is, but I, I would bet it's an intrusive of some sort, and I bet that's an intrusive as well. So what I guess was getting to here is that We've got a, a kilometre and a half of, of uh, virtually totally and uh, prospective uh, linears where right in the middle we know there is some Kimberlite. So you'd, you'd have to be a betting man and say we've probably got, got another Kimberlite in there. This is another image, like the area where we found the Vossa Dikes just in here. Uh, it's we'd, we'd be really disappointed if we didn't find more Kimberlite through here. This is just a summary of of uh, what we intend doing, as I described <coughs> just now. We're looking at the wolves in detail around the known bodies, and then getting further and further away from those bodies in in two tranches between two and five k's and then extending that to about 10 kilometers. And this is a summary of what we've, uh, what we've actually achieved, I guess, uh, which sounds a bit lame now. But anyway, I'll go on to what I think is the most important slide that I've got here and the most important slide that I can show you chaps. The the major differences between ourselves and, and the, most of the Canadian bodies and the Canadian mines has got nothing to do with the geology of, of the cumulants or the diamond content. What it has got to do enormously is with the fact that we can get a taxi from Kusumo International Airport and uh, in 30 minutes we can be walking on top of the cumulants at the walls. Uh, and have travelled all that distance on a blacktop road. And all of the differences in, uh, in costs, not only in exploration, but in uh, development and capitalisation, that go with having a diamond mine. If you compare one in Canada, a diamond mine is going to cost you $2 billion and, and the rest to bring into production. I don't believe you're going to spend a tenth of that to bring a diamond mine into production here in Kusama. 
in the same area as the walls. Uh, and that is really a summary of what I've said in those four, four points there. It's a, it's a remarkable location to have seriously diamond drifters kimberlites. In the last 40 odd years that I've been in this business, I've never come across anything like this. We have a combination of, of uh, good grades and uh, what the potential of having high, higher value stones in uh, a logistically amazingly benign environment.